Good morning. Welcome to the Fireside Chat, Reflections on Six Decades of Service to the Nation. Now please welcome IMSA President Suzanne wilson Hecklenburg. Good morning and welcome to our program today. We are pleased at IMSA and FCA International to co-host two extraordinary IC leaders for a moderated discussion about strategic intelligence, the evolution of threats and threat actors, workforce and technology trends, and much, much more. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have questions, and I know there will be a lot because we have over 400 registered attendees, please submit the questions through the question box on the right side of your screen. Our moderator will do her best to get to them. Speaking of moderators and extraordinary leaders, I have the pleasure of introducing today's morning's moderator, the Honorable Joan Dempsey, who is a trailblazer for women entering the senior executive ranks of the defense and intelligence communities. She spent 25 years in the federal government, which included senior roles with the Office of Naval Intelligence, Defense Intelligence Agency, as well as CIA. During her career, Joan was also a political appointee of both major political parties. After retiring from government, she worked at Booz Allen Hamilton, where she rose to the position of executive vice president and senior partner. In addition to the many awards and accolades garnered throughout her career, Joan is a 2004 Insa William Oliver Baker Award recipient. It is my pleasure to welcome our moderator, the Honorable Joan Dempsey. Good morning, Suzanne, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. My mother would not have done that well. I appreciate it very much. And I am delighted to be invited to what I think is one of the most interesting forums that INSA and ASEA in partnership have done of late, and that's a dialogue with the Admirals Studeman, two extraordinary intelligence officers who combine, whose combined careers span almost 100 years of national security experience. Now, obviously, we won't begin to scratch the surface of their knowledge and insight this morning, but we will try to distill some of the pacing issues for our nation's security in our discussion. Let's start with Studeman the Elder. Good morning, Bill. Can you talk to us about how intelligence has evolved from the industrial age of 60 years ago to the fully global information age of today, and particularly the evolution of intelligence, cyber, and information warfare, and do it all in five minutes? Oh, what a great challenge. Uh, thanks, Joan. Um, let me say first, I, I want to reminisce for a minute. Um, I uh, entered the Navy through OCS. Uh, I reported to uh, Newport in October of 1962, uh, right in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, I was steeped uh, very early on on uh, the importance of strategic matters in the, in the intelligence area. And so I uh, was able to reflect on how well the intelligence community later on in a retrospective performed uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Not a bad grade, actually, except for the fact that we did not know that there were nuclear weapons on board, uh, two nuclear weapons each, torpedoes on, on the Foxtrot class submarines, four of them that were down in the Sargasso Sea or the Atlantic. And then later on, I think the, uh, the major other nuclear strategic level a crisis that uh, happened in the period of time of the Cold War was the Riyadh crisis. Now, there is an area where Andropov, as the head of the KGB, uh, thought that the United States was going to and NATO were going to start a nuclear war, and he uh, wound the country up, and particularly the intelligence services, to collect information, and they were on a hair trigger. And so these are the two strategic nuclear uh, events. Uh, intelligence did not perform very well in the latter case. And so I only want to point out that when you think about intelligence, st strategic intelligence comes first, and then theater-related intelligence, and then tactical-related intelligence. So my period of the Cold War, keep in mind spanning uh, the Cold War I define as the 45 years from, from, uh, from the end of World War II until the end of the Cold War around 1990, the Soviet Union being far older than that, almost 70 years old. 
watching the Soviet state uh, with uh, the high focus which the intelligence community had during that period of time, watching it move uh, from obviously a very threatening power uh, in virtually all dimensions to where it deteriorated for the end of its life uh, and finally collapsed in the 1990 period uh, as the modern world essentially encroached on them as essentially the West outpaced them, they knew it. A lot of that reflection, I think, was uh, was in uh, what was happening in the context of, of uh, defense-related relationships, but there were technology-related relationships, whether it's space, threats to the, the homeland, uh, when uh, Reagan, who was a major factor in the collapse, declared Star Wars and a sense that uh, the Soviets could never catch up. And so now we're living with uh, the reborn imperial state, uh, Putin, uh, all the uh, things that are going on around the UK, Ukraine experience. A very dangerous time when, again, the uh, nuclear threats are back, essentially stated and prognosticated by lots of people. Uh, we're living in an era where the whole issue of nuclear deterrence has changed its factors. We're living in the information age now. I come out of the industrial age where the relationship between industry and, uh, and, and government was defined in a certain kind of way. Uh, you were making a remark at the beginning about the fact that uh, it's too bad people can't go back and forth between government and industry. I think that's a very important point because there, while there are two different cultures, there's a strategic vital partnership that exists between the, the industry and government. And uh, we learn a lot of lessons when we leave go uh, government and go into industry that we wish we knew uh, before. So I'm glad we're going to talk about that uh, factor a little bit later. Um, the government industry relationship is critical uh, to the strategic posture of this country. Uh, and it's critical throughout all this period that you've talked about. It's when we move from the industrial age effectively into the information age, uh, the cyber age, the AI age, the, all the new uh, buzzwords that we have to deal with today and trying to define how intelligence is, is uh, attempting to do its business in this particular time frame. So this history is really important going through all of that time frame uh, that goes to uh, the collapse of the Soviet empire in 1990, the emergence of the rest of the world, the problem, the refocusing of the intelligence community onto the rest of the world, probably left, uh, really didn't focus on the residual new Russian state uh, as it was emerging in this time frame, as much as we needed to, because it was still making mischief all over the world, uh, supporting communist uh, movements or other kinds of incursions and other states here and there, proxy wars, et cetera, uh, and propping up states. So we move into this uh, new information age where there's restructuring going on on our side, uh, very important uh, uh, factors related, but we also move into the global war on terrorism. And this is a fundamentally different form of intelligence. Now we're having to refocus back, rebalance the intelligence community into dealing with uh, the, these, the new major state threats of the future, which uh, are, uh, are uh, main competitors, uh, the, the PRC, obviously, and continuing to be Russia, but also the crazy states, Iran and North Korea. So let me stop there and uh, let's move on to your next question. All right, Bill, thank you. There are so many threads I would like to pull from your comments, but I want to do a hard shift for a moment. And Mike, if you, um, I don't know if you're having problems with your, there you go. There you are. There's the uh, Studeman, the younger. Um, Mike, your dad raised a number of points, and I can recall as an elementary student in the U.S. in Arkansas, of all places, being very aware of the nuclear threat from the Soviet Union. We're not in that situation today with what is our, probably our pacing threat for at least the next few generations, and that's China. You made a recent speech at AFCEA where you noted that Americans are naive and ill-informed about China and suffered from what you termed China blindness. Very different from the environment that your dad just described about the industrial age and the threat from the Soviet Union. Do you believe that the intelligence community is uh, doing enough on China? Is the national security community doing everything it can to inform 
uh, people and warn of the threat from China and their threat in particular to our military, industrial, economic, and information security. In five minutes, please. Yeah, thanks, John. I appreciate you being part of this. Um, and, uh, and I think these are really worthy topics. Uh, I do believe that we have not had conversations with the country uh, about uh, the full expanse of the China challenge to the United States and our allies and partners. There's a lot of quiet work going on inside government. There are decisions all the time that you will see in the news that allow you to, in a sort of an event by event way, get a sense that somebody's doing something about the China uh, issues, uh, the latest being restrictions on you know, technologies for equity venture capital firms uh, in key technologies related to AI and advanced semiconductors and things like that. But where I think we're falling down on the job is having those uh, calm, balanced, objective conversations uh, with the country to sensitize it to the nature of dangers, which are much more omnipresent than uh, you would actually guess if you're just proceeding in your own lane, in your own stovepipe in the world. And I believe that that's the role of senior officials, uh, government officials, all the way up to the White House, but it doesn't have to only be the White House, to be able to describe what we're dealing with. Uh, if you are uh, listening to perhaps the FBI director, you'll get from him, you will get a pretty clear understanding of some of the dangers. And um, the director puts uh, some dots together, he connects some things. But by and large, it's a topic that's almost being eschewed uh, by too many others. And there's a weird, uncanny silence in the public fora about the true nature of the threat. And it really, I think, is up to uh, officials to be able to be the one to, to frame it and to be able to highlight it in a way that we did uh, throughout the Cold War in the 20th century. And until we frame it properly, then we're gonna misdiagnose it, we'll underappreciate it, and we'll make decisions which in the long run may come back to haunt us. And so I do believe that's the missing element and the, and the difference between the way today we're dealing with China versus the way that we dealt with the Soviet Union in my father's era. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting uh, challenge for us because we typically take threats seriously only after they're, and I'm talking about we, the collective body politic, the collective um, intellectual um, uh, community inside the U.S., only take issues and, and really get serious about them after there's been a crisis. And uh, Bill, you referred to two crises that I think uh, really energize people around the Soviet Union. Uh, I hope that Taiwan is not going to be the crisis that makes the body politic come together and be serious and united about China. Uh, but I do, I do have that concern. I want to, this is not a very elegant shift, but I want to shift gears for a moment. And um, you've, you have both made a very strong case for a, uh, for a competent, compelling intelligence community. Next year will be my 50th year of having a, a security clearance. And one of the biggest changes I've seen in those 50 years has been the role of industry. Industry during the industrial age built satellites, provided bandwidth, uh, sensors, did a lot of things that were very important to our community and to our national security. But what we've seen in the information age is that industry is now permeating all aspects of intelligence. Although we are outsourcing a lot of the previous industrial intelligence capabilities to the commercial industry. I'm very interested, and Bill, I'll start with you, where you see industry going in the future as we mature the information age. And Mike, jump in if you have something to offer in this too. Well, let me just say, first off, uh, going to a high level, industry is critical, strategic. Uh, it, it's a, our major partner managing the uh, our relationships with industry is strategic to leadership in this country, uh, tracking essentially uh, what they're doing and where they are, optimizing the way in which we essentially uh, acquire means. The intelligence business is fundamentally, I think, 
and uh, except for the human side of it, a technology business. So we are forever uh, required to optimize our relationship with industry. And I think that uh, there are a lot of leaders in the Intel community that don't really recognize the degree to which that relationship is truly strategic. I know that uh, when I went to NSA first, which is a major acquirer of means and remains so today, and also has had to build major outreach engines to deal with the, all aspects of industry in, in every quarter, uh, which is which I which I think is enlightened on their part. Uh, I had to essentially uh, uh, find a way to learn more at my level and move a lot of the strategic uh, relationships with industry into the front office because they were in the hands of the acquisition specialists. Um, there are a lot of things we can do to optimize acquisition. I have participated over my life in both industry and uh, in uh, and in government in uh, in some very uh, interesting and innovative ways in which to acquire means. And uh, unfortunately, in the acquisition business. Uh, we are often reacting. Uh, the industry guys have the technology. We have the problems. The art form here is to make sure that they understand what our needs are, what our requirements are. Uh, I, you mentioned why it would be good to go back and forth uh, and have people have careers that can be in, in industry and, and in government at the same time because there is so much interaction that's required uh, in order to do that. Uh, around industry and the acquisition process, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of there is a lot of uh, uh, process, uh, unnecessary process. Uh, we still want to acquire around big bang acquisition. I sort of recognized later on in my life that I preferred more spiral acquisition. Um, I don't think we know how to do the blitzing. And uh, acquiring means very rapidly today, as we did in the in the earlier years. Uh, I think that we have a problem with multi-year. We have a problem with protests. We have all problems with, with the legal side of it. We need to clean up and constantly uh, improve where we stand on on essentially the government industry partnership. I have sort of five or six major criteria I think are important for intelligence. Um, leadership, strategy, organized for success, organizing the relationship between industry and government, optimizing it, making sure it's high speed, uh, making sure we have the oversight required for it, we're spending the taxpayers' money efficiently is a very important uh, requirement there. So let me stop there uh, again, and uh, there are a lot of people here who've had that experience, and uh, it's something that I think is, again, strategic. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, I understand that I'm having problems with my, um, with my video line right now, so clearly I have not excelled at technology from an industry perspective, uh, but uh, you can hear me, so this may be a better solution. Mike, uh, you're welcome to comment on industry and the role of industry and your experiences, but I also want to expand this to talk about another major issue that we're dealing with in the IC, and that's the changes that are going on in the workforce. Uh, not surprisingly, the zero trust sentiment that really permeates our society today seems to be taking hold with the new generations who should be coming into the IC right now. But the, their desire for remote work and uh, the still very highly competitive job market we're just seeing enormous pressures on our ability to hire and retain our workforce. You've been living with this. What advice do you have to IC and industry leaders for dealing with these issues? Hey, Joan, can I can I uh, tackle the industry one real quick? Because I do think that there yeah. are areas where the government is too far behind, and I um, and I say this because uh, because I can take a look at uh, the Chinese and to, to a lesser extent, the Russians, I can say that they're moving out uh, probably faster than we are in harnessing everything related to artificial intelligence. And, uh, and in the Chinese case, you know, they've set out to be an intelligence superpower by 2049. They have done concept development, which is far in advance of U.S. concept development 
for intelligence. They, they've reimagined it. They've taken many of our ideas that may have started with net centric warfare, and they have uh, moved well beyond sort of the TCPED obsession that we have within the US intelligence community. They don't just hunt for secrets. In fact, uh, they say that's uh, way insufficient to be able to actually have information dominance. Their view is the real secret is to get as much open source information as possible, and they've raised up the primacy of acquisition of data. And thus, if you wanted to have a TikTok conversation, we can have it with you. But the idea of getting massive amounts of data from many sources, including the classified ones, but then amalgamating those in a way that allows them to actually be able to run your uh, analytics on top of them and be able to not only analyze what's currently happening and not only get uh, uh, predictive, but to move into the prescriptive world where in fact you create such high fidelity digital twins of human behavior, of state policies, of military patterns, of sheer capabilities of unique platforms, that if you are able to make a digital twin out of those, you can essentially run in advance using the computer systems, right? To be able to look at courses of action that those other actors are likely to take, anticipate what they are, right? test as things change to see whether or not those predictive COAs, course of actions are being followed by your opponent and adjust accordingly as you go forward so that you can prescriptively anticipate and always be a step ahead of your adversary. And it doesn't matter if it's economic policy or a military operation. This is where the Chinese heads are. They're talking about you know, intelligence supra planning and parallel intel analysis and all these other things. And we have uh, frankly been uh, too, uh, I think, firmly grounded in our traditional view of what intelligence looks like in the future. And I think we're stovepiped. Uh, I think we're not having those conversations uh, sufficiently uh, within the US intelligence community. So for those who actually have access to the technology, know what we can really do, I think the industry can help push some of these concepts forward so that busy people in government can see how it all hangs together and we can really reimagine what we're going to actually need to do or will fall behind uh, a, an opponent that has a different plan for how they intend to use that information. So that's so a John, I, Just to jump in for a second, I, you know, I, again, I think Michael's got something going here. The, the, to me, the issue, my big factors for considering where we are in, in the play relates to leadership. I think leadership needs to be looked at in terms of our ability to move down the road. To, uh, to have strategies for this, to organize for success. I still think we have a problem making the proper adjustments here, to uh, properly resource, but most of all, to essentially do the governance, the strong governance required to move the, move ourselves quickly. We're, we're just not moving at the rate at which, which our adversaries are pacing. And so um, we, we have got to wake up somewhere along the way and this awakening it seems to be slow in coming. And so, again, I think uh, the Intel community could lead the way, uh, but it's going to take a lot of effort and uh, it's going to take a lot of, I think, uh, outside uh, actions to drive. I think that we're learning a lot in the Ukraine operation that's relevant here. But again, our pace is not quick enough. Yeah, I want to, uh, because I did get a question from Nicole Pilkus of the NRO who asked, do you think that the U.S. approach to strategic intelligence has changed from the Cold War to the uh, global war on terror to the great power competition. I'll sum summarize your comments and say, no, you don't think it's changed enough in terms of how we are doing intelligence today. Is that correct? Right. I, I think, uh, first off, I think strategic intelligence uh, is, is really uh, imp so important that there ought to be a lot of focus on going there and expertise and and uh, the kinds of things that Michael was talking about in terms of getting ready for defining uh, actions around the strategic relationship, including the warfighting part. To me, 
focusing on the war fighting is one of the biggest deterrent dimensions of this and the signaling and uh, the other kinds of things that need to go forward in the information warfare kind of context. Uh, so uh, deterrence is still important as a first priority, uh, but then you need to be able to very quickly signal that you're capable of, of moving to war fighting with significant implications for the adversary. Uh, I'm not sure we're thinking our way through that in the way in which uh, it's required. And I know we do the gaming, but the gaming to me is just not enough. It's not continuous. It doesn't involve enough people. It, it, it essentially, and then below that, it, we have to move our way all the way down to being really threatening on the lethal side. The targeting needs to be really uh, exercised and and uh, and clearly defined and uh, understandable even to the adversary that there is great risk to him that that uh, we have high capabilities in this area and are going to be accurate and uh, are, are that will have great implications for the adversary. I would throw in that uh, strategic intelligence and other terms we've used uh, are very uh, narrowizing, I guess. It's not a word, but you know what I mean. Because when we bound ourselves like that, we actually don't uh, adequately uh, compare ourselves to the nature of the challenge. So if you're, if you're on the Chinese side, you're like, yeah, strategic intelligence is one of many things that I want to instantly fuse to be able to have full-on awareness. I want to do continuous uh, uh, net assessment using all powers available to me, blue, red, white, green, all the colors of what matters, right, that would affect any decision. And I want to actually have that all integrated into one place. And then I want to use my computer systems to be able to then project forward the likely behaviors of this adaptive system and then highlight what things are gonna be more likely and then continually test myself along the way to see if my predictions are accurate or not. That is, that is the use of strategic intelligence, but strategic intelligence is only one part, one element of this larger amalgamation of information, right? So we don't bound it by intelligence. We don't bound it by you know, some other terms that we've traditionally used here. We're very good at following our rules in the intel community. We don't do economic intelligence, right? We don't do net assessment. We don't do a lot of things that our adversaries are not afraid of doing. And I think we're gonna end up being shorted in the long term. We'll find that more and more things will look like the adversary's omniscient. Uh, and we wanna understand why, because we didn't prioritize getting all forms of information in one place in a way that doesn't adhere to our traditional legalistic ways that we operate today in the United States. But we also don't control every aspect of American society, economic, political, military, like the Chinese do in their own country. So I understand what you're saying, Mike. I think it's very hard to take that sort of approach in the US, but I don't think we even understand what's going on. So um, I, you've laid out a very compelling case for how we need to think differently. I want to get to it. We're getting some great questions. Jeff Selden with Voice of America asked, uh, Mike, you mentioned that the public's not getting a full sense of the threat from China. How much of that can be tied to China's various influences inside the U.S.? Are there certain kinds of Chinese influence operations that are making it harder to counter their influence? Ooh, it, he's raised a taboo subject. You're not supposed to talk about the degree of Chinese penetration into the uh, United States today, but uh, I, I do think we need to like shed that. I think we need a, a strong wake-up call. We are deeply penetrated as a society. You know, uh, when you talk about the, the cyber IP theft, you know, I, I've used the statistic from the you know, uh, the National Bureau of Asian Research, which found that 250 to $600 billion of IP is stolen every year. Do you care? Um, because it would set you off on a series of actions that you need to take that are stronger than what we've taken uh, today. If you're in Hollywood, I, I use this sometimes as an example to say, show me a movie that's uh, one iota critical of China's place in the world, its rise and what it's doing internally or externally, around the world and you can't find one, a movie or a TV series today, if you go take a look at the latest Jack Ryan series, you're going to find some old Russian trope that they have to pull out, right? 
there are countless ways that the Chinese have been able to use their strengths in buying companies, including movie distribution capabilities within the United States, uh, to deny our ability to actually have the media talk about the China challenge in a way that's way overdue, right? That's an extent of Chinese influence over us. When I talk about Chinese psychological warfare, people are like, that's not, that doesn't affect me. And I say, you've all been affected by Chinese psychological warfare, including myself. When they say the East is rising and the West is declining, I bet you believe part of that. You're like, you know what, that might be true um, because of all of our challenges with polarization and domestic politics and authoritarian government's ability to move quickly. And so it's a, it's a question mark probably in your brain and that's delivered to you courtesy uh, of the Chinese to cast doubt in your own belief, in your own, and confidence in our own system of governance and our ability to prevail in the long run and protect the international system. Uh, the Chinese media presence globally is awesome. And it, it includes uh, penetration, deep penetration in our own country. So anyway, I would just say that examples keep going on. And this is once again, something that I think most of America is ignorant about, and they don't have to be, but we're not doing a good job of uh, giving them a sense for how much China's inside uh, the wire within the United States. All right, thanks, Mike. I think we could do an entire session, maybe a week on just that topic. Uh, we've had a couple of questions from folks about specific issues with the intelligence community. Mike Groen, a retired Marine, ask uh, what you two think about the digital transformation and the future of military intelligence specifically. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so again, uh, we're living in the, in the cyber world and the digital transformation is uh, a threat, uh, but it's also something in my view to harness. And it goes back to Michael's comment about uh, strategic competition, getting on down the road with uh, maximizing the government industry relationship for dealing with these kinds of strategic matters. Uh, the pace of what's happening in, in uh, the cyber information world, uh, whether it's AI, machine learning, it's all the buzzwords that are out there, quantum, it is totally staggering. The world will actually fundamentally uh, change and uh, we need to be uh, out in the lead there and in fact you know interestingly we are in the lead in many respects we don't give ourselves much credit for a lot of the innovation that is actually occurring right here or with our friends and allies and partners and by the way these friends and allies and partners are very important and need we need to open up and uh, operate uh, uh, more in my view uh, deeply with them since it's a Marine question, obviously it's an important question with regard to where the Marine is going, not only with regard to their power a projection from the sea and from, but from the land. And I think that that's an exciting thing going on in the Marine Corps. And intelligence has a very big role in trying to support that mission, not only with the context of intelligence's role in information warfare, either information defense or information exploitation, but also in the context of the real roles that we play in uh, theater support for targeting and uh, and vulnerability analysis and all the other things that happen. Yeah, Mike's, uh, he's the one that should be mic'd up and, uh, and giving sort of uh, the view there as the former uh, lead of the, the Jake working artificial intelligence uh, for the Defense Department. Uh, so there's nothing we could say that would add to his knowledge, but I do believe that he's right that we have uh, talked about our transformations. Our strategy documents are phenomenal. They actually say everything that's true. Where we sometimes uh, stumble is in the execution and the implementation of those very strategy documents. Uh, we can't exhaust ourselves on writing those and then sort of fail to deliver the complete capabilities that we need. And um, in the military, I would just say that we still have uh, an inordinate amount of money that goes into the platform world. Uh, and you can, you can, if you judge us based on sort of digital transformation, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of investment and capability going to automate our targeting process, to do fusion, to be able to do an analysis in ways where we have machine aided 
Uh, and so it's there, but not sufficient to task today. So if you go out with a carrier strike group or you go with other units, they still haven't seen the full benefit of the way that we intend to integrate all this stuff. And so we we don't time is not on our side. We we actually need to uh, come together, I think, and and do sprints uh, to allow more of that capability that we talk about all the time and truly field it uh, quick. Uh, rather than waiting for the perfect solution, you know, like JADC2 way down the line. What are you going to use in two years, not what are you going to use in 10 years, right? And so I think uh, his question actually is pregnated with frustration that maybe we just don't move quick enough on our own ideas. And I would agree with that uh, assessment of where we stand. Yeah, you, you've both pulled on several threads from the earlier discussion as well about acquisition, about industry and how we interact with it to try to deliver capabilities and how slow and cumbersome that is. Um, I can't let the two of you get away without asking this audience question, and that is, uh, what kinds of lessons learned do we have from some of the deep dives that occurred in Navy intelligence, and is there anything unique in the Navy's approach to addressing enigmas that we should extrapolate into larger intelligence issues? Well, I would just start out, but I spent most of my life in anti-submarine warfare, undersea warfare, submarine warfare related intelligence. By the way, one of the few areas we probably still have an advantage in and which has a sort of great play for the future. So intelligence support to undersea warfare and intelligence has always been a major hallmark of naval intelligence in terms of the relationship between the submarine community, the undersea warfare community, uh, et cetera. And it's an area where I think we've managed to sustain a lead. And it takes a lot of heavy lifting. Um, and we have uh, done this for the entire 60 years that I've been in the business. Uh, I started out in an ASW squadron, was in uh, CTF 67 in the med. Uh, and so again, uh, just picking an area where you have at least some residual superiority while you're waiting to blitz or mobilize in these other areas that. Michael talked about. By the way, our ability to blitz and mobilize seems to be essentially uh, the challenge at hand, but we don't seem to know how to do it. And so again, uh, take advantage of the areas that you have uh, advantages in, build on them, and move forward. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would I would say that uh, the Chinese are realizing uh, and have been investing in trying to eliminate our undersea advantage. And so we need not to be naive about where they are putting a lot of money in terms of seabed, water column systems, airborne systems, surface systems, much of it unmanned, designed with scale uh, to be able to uh, put more sensing and then response measures in the water to eliminate our longstanding advantage. Some people say it's 20 years out. Uh, I'm not in that camp. I don't think 20 years from now, We'll start to see the threat. I think we're going to see it in the in the uh, 20s here, and uh, we need to be very astute in tracking all of the various things that they're doing. And frankly, we don't have enough sensors in the West Pacific uh, or penetration to be able to do that successfully to to the level that I think we we need. I would also add, when it comes to naval intelligence, that the, what I've seen is the art of intelligence is just as important. Uh, the ability to actually uh, know cold uh, the strategic elements of a problem, the way that your adversary uh, thinks and therefore behaves, how they perceive, uh, how they run through their strategic calculus and decision making, uh, knowing that, but also having a sense of the operational nature of what's going on and the tactical things and being able to connect those all together so you have a blended understanding of how it all fits. And then when you have that understanding, having the confidence, right, almost the boldness to be able to go talk to senior officers and maybe persuade them uh, that our strategy isn't uh, necessarily fit for what we see or that we need to consider uh, you know, changes there uh, naval intelligence has always been, I think, strong in that regard, in those two talents, to not only understand the dynamics, but then have an ability to do something about it inside the blue circles, where it's really important for 
more senior people that aren't studying the problem as closely uh, need to be able to enact changes that uh, are going to work for us. And to me, those are two of the more prominent traits of the naval intelligence community. So, Mike, on that point, and I wasn't going to, I didn't think we had time to ask this, but it follows on perfectly with what you just said. We got a question, obviously, from somebody inside this community saying that there is a concern inside the information warfare community that we don't have enough opportunities for junior intel and IW officers to serve at sea and get the tactical and operational experience that will allow them in the future to lead uh, from inside the Navy. Do you agree with that concern and is there is there a solution to it? Um, it hasn't been raised as a major issue in terms of throughput for people going to see to see how it works. I guess, you know, my observation of that would be, well, what are you actually learning when you are at sea? Because many of the places where you're going to learn your tradecraft, uh, particularly in information warfare today, are, are are not there. You can learn some critical elements of it, but keep in mind, even on a carrier strike group, you're still at the tactical level. There are many more things you can learn in a maritime operations center at one of the numbered fleets uh, that uh, may be ashore or in some of the other uh, commands uh, like the Navy Cyber uh, Defense Operations uh, Center and other places in Fort Meade. So you can develop your information warfare uh, tradecraft and knowledge almost anywhere uh, today. And sort of the question is how you want to sequence those. Um, but the opportunities, I think, are still legion for those who really want to become expert. Bill, any closing comments on that point? Well, I think that, you know, first off, there's always been a special relationship that exists between the Navy leadership and the um, uh, and the uh, naval intelligence, uh, naval cryptology, uh, and now cyber information warfare uh, community side. I do think that the Navy has to, the Navy leadership has to step up and take some special care to nurture that. It's a two-way street to create that kind of relationship. And that, and that speaks to where our people learn their trade. And uh, I think that uh, the, there's a lot of demand uh, going on, but, the, but uh, the leadership of the intelligence, uh, a lot of the intelligence businesses are now essentially being overseen by people who don't have great uh, long careers in intelligence. So the Navy needs to look to how it essentially is going to use its information warfare community, all of it. All of those communities deal with threats, whether it's intelligence or, or cyber or information warfare, or whether it's communications, IT, uh, weather, uh, oceanography, these are the threats of the future. Uh, we're living in the information age, so the Navy needs to adjust, and it needs to adjust quickly. Yeah, I can tell you, I don't, I don't know the answer to this issue, and I don't know how to balance the um, the operational experience against the tradecraft and and the deep expertise that we need for the future. I will tell you that I spent the first three years of my intelligence career inside a Woolen Weber antenna. Uh, as close to forward deployed as women could get in the mid 1970s. And there has never been any experience I've ever had in my life that compared with what I learned in those three years. This has been a fascinating conversation. I'd love to be a guest at a, at a uh, dinner party with the, with the two Studemans to hear this dialogue continue. You all have been absolutely terrific this morning. I can't thank you enough. It's been a riveting discussion. But now the time has come to turn this forum over to Lewis Shepard, who is the AFCEA Intel Committee Chair, to close. Lou? Yeah, I agree, Joan. Thank you for moderating uh, what was a truly insightful discussion and really valuable, I think, to all the attendees. On behalf of AFCEA and INSA, I want to thank both admirals, uh, Bill and Mike. Thank you so much for sharing the time. I agree, Joan. I think we all need to spend a long Thanksgiving weekend at the Studeman household listening to uh, a, a protracted discussion of these topics. To our audience, thank you for logging in. When this webinar ends in just a moment, there'll be a survey uh, option that pops up. Please uh, take that survey uh, and answer uh, the couple of minutes worth of questions. Let us know how we did and uh, what you'd like to see in further conversations from AFC and INSA. 
Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day.